Russia is escalating its attacks across Ukraine. Russian forces are reported to be intensifying fighting in the suburbs of the capital and have also stepped up their bombardment of Kyiv. Emergency services say at least two people were injured in new strikes on the city this morning. For residents of the Ukrainian capital, every passing day brings further shelling, more homes lost and more casualties. Is she alive? Yes, she's alive. Get her in the car. A citywide curfew was imposed on Tuesday and will last until Thursday morning. Ahead of the curfew, people rushed to the stores to stock up on food and supplies. The situation in the city is not bad. People are holding up. We're supported by the volunteers and the territorial defense. Meanwhile, President Volodymyr Zelensky said he saw hope for compromise in talks between Russia and Ukraine, even as Moscow stepped up its assault. It is important. It's difficult, but important, because any war ends in an agreement. Meetings continue. As I'm told, the positions in the negotiations sound more realistic. However, there still needs to be more time for decisions to be in Ukraine's interests. On Tuesday, leaders from three EU countries visited Kyiv, bringing a message of support. They reiterated their desire to give Ukraine a way to join the EU as soon as possible. I hope it should be agreed over the next couple of uh, days or weeks, and the candidate status should be given till the end of this year at the latest. Thank you. The capital bracing for the next round. This medical team has set up a field hospital in a bomb shelter for the worst case scenario of having to treat the wounded here. The people of Kyiv know their ordeal is far from over. Well, for more, let's bring in our correspondent Alexandra von Nam. She's in uh, Lviv in, Eastern U in western Ukraine. Alexandra, there's been increased shelling in and around the capital, Kyiv. Uh, what's the situation there? What are you hearing? Kiev is under a curfew that was announced yesterday with the city's mayor urging all residents to seek shelter, to take cover, because the Russian forces are apparently intensifying their attacks on the Ukrainian capital. We know that heavy fighting is going on on the outskirts of Kiev. We know that there were explosions in the city center. Uh, there are also reports about uh, um, Russian missiles uh, striking uh, um, apartment building that is quite close to the center. So this 12-floor uh, apartment building was uh, apparently struck and uh, first responders were trying to get people out of the apartment. Some of, their, of them were on fire this morning. Um, as I said earlier, you're in Lviv, that's in the west of Ukraine, where it's relatively quiet. Uh, but are people there worried that the violence, the shelling, the bombardments will soon reach that part of the country as well? They are worried, of course. They are scared. Many uh, told me that they think that it's just a question of time before the war will come here as well. We just have to remember that only a few days ago, a military training center just 30 kilometers away from Lviv was struck by Russian missiles. So people are scared. And we just have to stress the importance of Lviv. That is only not, not only an important hub for aid deliveries towards uh, the east Eastern part of the country, but it is also a place where many people flee. They flee the fighting in the eastern part of Ukraine, and then they move on to travel on uh, across the border to Poland or other European nations. Alexandra, we heard in our report there that President Zelensky uh, is more optimistic. He said he believes Russia may now be more open to negotiations, that their position might, as he put it, be more realistic now. Uh, what are we to make of that? 
Well, he really sounded cautiously optimistic, uh, um, suggesting that Russia has softened its stance, not demanding any more that Ukraine surrender. Uh, we also heard from some senior members of the negotiating team. One of them said that there is room for compromise. However, he also added uh, that there are still uh, big differences, contradictions between the two sides. Uh, we know that what is at the table, apparently both sides are discussing that, is a future neutrality of Ukraine. And according to past statements, that could be something that the Ukrainian government could be potentially ready to discuss with the, uh, President Zelensky, saying that Ukraine has to accept that it will not become a member of NATO despite the open door policy of the alliance. But of course, both sides seem to be still far apart uh, with regard to their positions. DW correspondent Alexandra von Namen there. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has said that he sees, quote, some hope for reaching a compromise in negotiations with Kyiv. That's after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also sounded a positive note on the ongoing talks, as we heard earlier. In an interview with Russian TV channel RBK, Lavrov said that a neutral status is being seriously discussed in connection with security guarantees. The, uh, there are concrete formulations that, in my view, are close to being agreed. Let's now bring in uh, Michael Barsicu, a global affairs analyst with the Atlantic uh, Council. Uh, um, let's start uh, uh, th with this, Michael. Ukraine and Russia are now indicating that there's hope for a compromise uh, to end the war. Um, what do you think that would look like? Uh, good to be with you. Well, if you had asked me this very same question a month ago, I would have said the Ukrainian population had zero appetite for a compromise, especially if it came to uh, putting aside its uh, bid to become a member of NATO or the EU. Uh, now we're looking at a nation that in many parts of Ukraine, as your correspondent indicated, has been bombed into submission and the bombing continues in places like Kiev. But it has to be said, I cannot overestimate this enough, that uh, there's a lot of anger here on the streets in Lviv and elsewhere. There's a lot of arms in the hands of people. People are thinking back to the Maidan uh, times of 2013 and 2014 and saying, we, we did not spill our children's blood for nothing. We did not show up there for nothing. So this could spiral out of control very, very quickly, given the current atmosphere. Uh, so I think Zelensky, Zelensky is in a very, very tough spot. There, just quickly, there is, of course, an appetite, a very big appetite for the war to stop. But um, I actually predicted this some time ago that Zelensky may be pressured by Western allies to go for that kind of compromise. It's a very dangerous route indeed. Let's go one step further. If there is any kind of compromise or negotiated settlement, uh, a peace deal even, who will be uh, guaranteeing that? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, um, as much as the Russians may be trying to show their good side, diplomatic side, whatever you want to call it, of these talks, uh, they're not to be trusted. Uh, they weren't uh, they didn't they weren't to be trusted in the, you know, the guarantee of the safety of people fleeing in those humanitarian uh, corridors. Uh, there's now fears that they're not uh, doing well on the battlefield. So they may actually escalate their use of shelling escalate use of banned weapons and possibly even turn to chemical weapons. So we're in very, very dangerous uncharted territory at the moment. Uh, is U Ukrainian President Zelensky in a strong enough position domestically to agree to any kind of negotiated settlement? You mentioned the, the anger in the country before. Yeah. Well, his uh, popularity ratings are at an all-time high. He has surprised his most fiercest critics in terms of stepping up to the plate and becoming a war president. There's no training, you know, to become a wartime president like he has. He's done extremely well. He's stood up to the Russians, the second biggest army in the world. But uh, again, because of the... Uh, various delicate uh, conditions that we're facing right now with this anger, with the high, high death toll, with the degree of destruction, um, it's very, very difficult to predict whether he'd get enough support from Ukrainians to at least temporarily shelve the NATO bid. I, I think maybe that could be a kind of compromise if 
uh, Zelensky told his people that this is a temporary thing just for us to regroup, uh, get the Russians out, stop the bombing and rebuild, but remains to be seen. Michael Barsicu there from the Atlantic Council think tank. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Top defense officials from NATO countries are discussing further help for Ukraine as the country fights back against Russia's invasion. Ministers include U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin uh, um, are meeting in Brussels. Austin repeated that the alliance would abide by its promise to protect the Eastern European member states if Russia launched an attack. But Estonia, a smaller NATO member bordering Russia, continued to call for the alliance to set up a no-fly zone in Ukraine. This is a step the alliance has refused to take so far, as Ukraine is not a member. But NATO said it has to ensure the conflict does not spill over into Ukraine's neighbors. We are reinforcing our collective defense. Hundreds of thousands of troops uh, on uh, heightened alert. Uh, 100,000 troops, uh, U.S. troops in Europe, and then uh, uh, 40,000 uh, troops under NATO uh, command, direct NATO command, mostly in the eastern part of the alliance, uh, supported by uh, naval and uh, air uh, forces. NATO has the responsibility to ensure that this crisis do not uh, escalate beyond Ukraine, and that's also the reason why we have increased the presence in the eastern part of the alliance. Let's bring in Christine Mundwa in uh, Brussels for more. Uh, Christine, does Stoltenberg's statement effectively mean that NATO will not get involved in the war in Ukraine at all, as long as a NATO member country is not attacked? That's right, uh, Gerhard. What we are listening to is the Secretary General reiterating uh, the NATO alliance's position that everything that NATO is doing, the, the long-term security strategy that it's been discussing in, in the meetings today, uh, all the defence spending and, and all the, uh, the, the, the bolstering of units and all the provisions and the measures that NATO is taking uh, are only uh, for the event that a NATO member comes under attack. Ukraine is not a NATO member um, and will likely not be one. We heard that as well from the Ukrainian uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky, who on Tuesday really gave the most explicit acknowledgement of the fact that Ukraine's desire to join NATO uh, would likely not be realized um, anytime soon. And it's something that Zelensky said uh, that he had accepted. So NATO has been firm on its position that it does not believe its direct involvement in this conflict uh, would bring an end to the conflict. In fact, the contrary. NATO's position is that this would extend and, and, and expand this conflict um, and uh, take us to a place uh, where World War III is, is a closer reality than what many people would like to think. So uh, membership, uh, one thing. Uh, weapons delivery is another. Will NATO continue to supply weapons to Ukraine? That's right. I mean, we heard that from uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, who, who came on record again today to say that NATO stands uh, by Ukraine. It supports Ukraine's uh, uh, right uh, to be able to defend itself against Russia in the case of this invasion, reiterating again that NATO will continue to supply defensive military uh, equipment and weaponry to the Ukrainians. Uh, we know, for example, the Dutch uh, um, defense minister also uh, uh, reiterated uh, the, the Netherlands' commitment in that they will continue uh, to send um, military aid uh, to Ukraine, even as uh, these could be targeted, these um, aid convoys could be targeted uh, in Russian attacks. So NATO's position is that it does support Ukraine financially with military aid, defensive military aid, to be able to defend itself, because that is a right uh, that it believes uh, Ukraine has, and we will support that to the full. So is NATO membership for Ukraine now completely off the table forever? That is basically what it, it sounds like. And as I was pointing out, those remarks uh, by Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, um, really the most explicit acknowledgement that he's at least come out and said in public. Uh, we know, for example, the UK uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson as well completely took that off of the table to say it's just not feasible, it's not likely. It doesn't appear that there is going to be a path uh, for Ukraine to be joining NATO or to be given NATO membership uh, at any time soon. 
soon. We are not going to see NATO engage on behalf of Ukraine in terms of confronting Russia directly, not in the way of a no-fly zone on Ukrainian skies, not in the way of sending troops, Western troops, uh, to Ukraine. So that is almost a definitive yes at this stage. Uh, there are no indications, no appetite among NATO's 30 allies, uh, member states, that there would be any uh, Ukraine joining the alliance anytime soon. DW correspondent Christine Montbar reporting from Brussels there. Thank you, Christine. I'm now joined by Ukrainian German writer Katya Petrovskaya. Uh, Katya, you are currently in contact with people in Kiev. You were born and, and, and raised there. How concerned are people there about uh, what NATO is currently doing? Um, people are concerned about what uh, Putin is currently doing because, uh, you know, just to imagine that Kiev, which uh, which is supposed to be the first Russian city because Christianity was adopted there, it's the most ancient Russian city in the, in the uh, perspective of history. And actually, the city was <laughs> the, the, the Knights of Kiev uh, founded Moscow. Uh, um, so it's really a crazy situation. Um, uh, people are... Uh, uh, really asking for maybe the, 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 the most important plea in Kiev is to close the sky and uh, the, the answer of NATO is no uh, because NATO is uh, concerned about escalation. Uh, the point is that actually Putin is uh, is in war against NATO already a long time, and uh, because he is like he even said that even uh, even sanctions against against uh, Russia is a military measure. Mm. So actually, uh, we yeah. Can I can I uh, just ask you, you? You have said that the West has a moral obligation to intervene militarily in the Ukraine war, including imposing a no-fly zone. But NATO, as we've heard, uh, uh, says that would be an escalation, draw NATO member states into the war. Isn't that a valid point? You think? Actually, you know, I'm not a military expert, but military experts are saying that uh, if NATO will insist, uh, so it will intervene in any. Uh, any kind of consul, uh, constellation, it would uh, mean the, the, the further escal uh, escalation. But, uh, but the point is that uh, Putin is somebody who is escalating without any kind of reason, you know. So um, uh, the point with NATO is not the most important. I think that uh, there are other possibilities, like uh, according to, uh, to Budapest memorandum, uh, uh, like a sort of constellation between US and Britain uh, to to help Ukraine, maybe not uh, completely to close the sky, but at least to protect uh, big cities, uh, um, um, nuclear power plant stations, uh, and uh, and the uh, the way to Lemberg to Lviv. Now, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is now saying that Ukraine could agree to a central Russian demand that Ukraine will not join NATO in the future. Do you think there will be support for a compromise peace deal with Russia if that helps to end the war? I don't know, but um, I, I really don't know. But um, I think that uh, Zelensky are looking for any possible um, way to finish this war, but at the same time not to humiliate uh, his own country. Just very briefly, you're also a German citizen. Is Germany doing enough to help Ukraine at I'm the moment? I'm not a German citizen. I, I still have only Ukraine passport. Understand. Thank you very much, Ukrainian German writer Katya Petrovskaya. Thank you.